Well, good afternoon, everyone. Glad you could make it for the Brown Bag Lecture. My name is Chandra, and I work at the Penticton Museum, and we put on the Brown Bag Lecture every Tuesday, which is why you're here, uh, from noon to one, and we have a variety of different speakers who come and talk. Uh, and today, our guest speaker is John Taplin. And uh, John is um, a resident of Naramata, and he's involved in the English language business. And he's going to talk to us about his experiences and the things that he's learned over the time working in that business. Um, and so I'm going to pass it over to you. Just a little housekeeping note, though, if you have a cell phone, if you don't mind setting it to quiet for us, that would be lovely. And uh, enjoy. Hearing from John. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Chandra, and uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, you can all hear me okay? I feel a bit like Garth Brooks here, uh, rigged up with this uh, headset. Uh, so, my talk today is based on a book that I wrote during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, the book was based on my experiences over about 40 years working in what we call the English language business. Uh, first as a high school teacher in Australia, and then I moved to Canada in 1984, married a beautiful woman from the prairies, and uh, then I moved into adult education uh, after that. And uh, one of the things that I had thought about for many years, for about 20 years, was that I would write a book about the specific nature of the English language business. And the pandemic actually gave me the opportunity to find the time to do it. Or it was either that or I would drive my wife crazy during the lockdown. So um, the book's called Easier Said Than Done, Adventures in the Language Business. And I have a number of chapters uh, and these are some of them. And some of them are germane to the English language business, and some of them have a bit more applicability to other businesses, uh, not only in education but in other fields. And I'll go into that a little bit in a little bit more detail towards the end. So, for example, um, some of the topics that are germane to the English language business, or at least in the areas that I worked, were the areas of adult homestay, where we would provide accommodation uh, for international students through our programs. Um, and then um, also looking at uh, global citizenship. In the first instance, we were teaching English as a second language to students, mainly adult students. But uh, it soon became very apparent to me that we were involved in a very interesting dynamic of um, helping people become global citizens, whatever that means. And for example, in the homestay families, uh, one of the best ways in which that worked, of course, there's money involved, families would be paid a fee by the student, but many families uh, saw this as an opportunity to host an international student and for their kids to have cultural exposure uh, to, that, to students from around the world. And the gold standard actually was where uh, you would actually have families later on, or even their kids when they became adults, visiting the students or their families in, in countries like Japan or Colombia. So that was a very rich kind of exchange. And we all know that travel broadens the mind, and I know a lot of people here are hopefully traveling again after the lockdown and the, of the pandemic, but we all know that when we do travel, uh, especially to second language cultures, it's, we discover a different uh, way in which people live and also um, we kind of in, in a way discover things that are different about ourselves and the way we interface with people in different cultures. Um, and I think from an educator's perspective, and um, I know we have probably many people here who have worked in different fields of education and training, we all say, well, I learned more from the students than they learned from me. And I think that's a kind of a rich thing to explore a little bit in terms of what do we learn from students as educators? And it goes, again, both ways. So, um, just in talking about international students, specifically in Canada, um, I thought I would give you a bit of an overview here of 
um, who our international students are and approximate numbers. There's been um, quite a bit of media attention recently and political attention to international students. And uh, I don't want to get too controversial, uh, but uh, I think it's interesting just to pull back and think about who the international students are that come to Canada. So the first uh, smaller group of students are actually younger students that are in youth programs uh, from kindergarten all the way to grade 12. Usually high school students and uh, they, they leave their families in their home countries and come for an experience sometimes of a semester, four months or a full academic year. And at last report, the last statistics I saw from the uh, Canadian Public Schools Association International uh, were that in 2019, there were about 38,000 students in that category. It's probably around about the same now, hopefully bouncing back uh, as we come out of the pandemic. The second category, and this is the area that I worked in, uh, mainly in Canada, is English or French language programs for adults. Uh, generally students aged 16 years and older, and students pretty much are in the demographic between 18 to 25, but we do see students that are older, and they come for a variety of purposes. Uh, some come just to improve their English in order to go back to their home countries and to be functioning better in English in their business settings. Like it or not, English is probably one of the main languages of business in the world, and so you know, Canada is a very attractive destination for people to come and study. French programs, of course, are available in Quebec, and the other purpose that we have in um, the adult language business is seeing students who actually go on to further university study or college study in Canada. So preparing them for the English skills that are good enough for them to function at post-secondary level. And the third category is actually that uh, section there, the adult post-secondary and diploma programs. And these are students that are typically on uh, study permits and uh, current estimates are that there are about 620,000 students in Canada who are studying uh, at university or college level in post-secondary degree and diploma programs and uh, those students will in most cases return to their home countries with, with those credentials. <coughs> So the sector in which I worked, um, adult language programs, um, is actually under the auspices or there's a, a professional accreditation body known as Languages Canada. And uh, this is a, an association which has about 200 members. Most of the members are private sector members, about two thirds of the members. Uh, these are language schools operating as businesses. And the other third are language programs operating in the colleges and universities themselves. So, for example, uh, many years ago I worked at the University of Lethbridge in Southern Alberta. We had an international program for students from uh, many different countries and they would come in and study English with a view to meeting the standards of English language proficiency in order to go on and uh, take degrees at at university level. So it's interesting I think for people to, to know that this is a fairly highly professionalized um, organization. Um, each year Languages Canada members provide, this is off their website so there's a little promotion here, quality accredited English and French language education to over 150,000 international students. So that's um, it's quite a lot and what members have to do is they have to fulfill a whole uh, set of standards through third party accreditation. For example, the teachers all have to be, not only have a, have a degree, an undergraduate degree as a minimum, but they have to have specific credentials for teaching English as a second language or as a foreign language. And many of them have more advanced degrees than that. 
And one of the areas that I wanted to look at was uh, just what do students uh, contribute to the Canadian economy? And these are some statistics from uh, the Languages uh, Canada website. And this is current information that each year Canada's English and French language education sector helps Canada generate $6.7 billion in export revenues. This is money coming in from offshore or outside of Canada. They create 75,000 jobs and prepare 35,000 students for higher education. So students that go on as international students, having met English and French language requirements to actually study in degree programs. And the source for this data was, is a couple of years old, but it probably hasn't changed that much uh, from a study undertaken about the estimating the comprehensive economic impact of international students in language education programs. And I might add that in um, this talk, not only uh, hoping to identify who international students are, uh, what international language programs add to the Canadian economy, but I also want to talk a little bit about um, what international students add to the local communities in which they live, and a related question, how the language industry contributes to global citizenship. So if we have comments or questions, we might just save them unless you want something clarified or need to heckle. I'm happy to do that in the moment, work with that. Um, and then finally, in the last section, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, why I decided to write a business and personal memoir. Uh, just some of the things that I've learned in that experience of actually producing a book and uh, uh, yeah, it might be helpful for some who are thinking of following the same pathway. So, what do international students do when they come to Canada? We know they study, we know they're um, in, involved in programs. Um, a whole bunch of things that they get involved with in the language programs in the, lang in, in the sector that I've been working at. Um, the first one is they live with families. Uh, I mentioned that one already. Uh, second one is they actually engage with the tourism industry. And that um, generates, again, quite a, a significant amount of revenue for the tourism industry. Most language programs have a recreational program for example, in our schools in Calgary and Victoria, we take students out to the mountains uh, and take them to hockey games and all kinds of things. So they really get an experience for living in Canada in the great outdoors and also um, knowing a bit about museum culture. For example, in Calgary, we would take students to the Glenbow Museum and uh, just other things to do with Experience, experiencing Canadian lifestyle. And the one that I could really identify with for international students having gone through this, moving from Australia, is experiencing the outdoors in winter. That's a challenge, okay? We're all living in the Okanagan for a reason, right? And it's a very interesting thing to see, actually, because when we first opened the school in Calgary in 1996, we actually had people saying, well, what do you guys do up there in Canada? You know, as if we lived in igloos. And we had, for example, people that would send us students from Mexico who were generally fearful of coming to Calgary. And when the students arrived, it was sort of like my first year in Canada, you're in a state of disbelief. Can it really be this cold? Can it really be minus 40? And then there's some hidden dangers with that. We had to tell students, hey, you can't be going outside without a toque on because it's not a good look to go back and have a frozen nose back to your home country. So there are all kinds of safety issues that actually came out of that. But overall, uh, students really enjoyed the experience. We'd see students, first snowfall of the season, they'd be out in the park across the school throwing snowballs at each other. Students from Mexico or other countries in South America sometimes from Asia, who had never seen snow before, and that was pretty interesting. The other part of this is just um, how they engage in the cities in which they live. So um, currently we have uh, schools in uh, Victoria and Calgary, um, 
through. Before the pandemic and before certain acquisitions, we also had other schools in Canada, in Vancouver and Toronto. And so, you know, we were able to offer in our group, Global Village, uh, a real variety of settings for, for students to come and study at. Another uh, part of the interaction that was kind of interesting that came out of language study. And I think one of the things you're seeing is even though the, uh, in the first instance, our goal is English language education, uh, it spawned a whole lot of other opportunities. And one that we saw was, you know, we created a mix with students from around the world, uh, was that students could actually learn not only about Canada, but learn about other cultures. And it was a really good way for people to sort of think about the stereotypes that, that we often think of. And, you know, this was quite interesting to explore. For example, for, for many students from South America, they'd never really thought about the cultural diversity within Asia. They thought that, you know, most, if they saw an Asian person, that they were Chinese. And then they learned through the program that actually, we had Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Taiwanese, and there were a lot of differences. The other thing that was very interesting for me was just how some of the old embassies in some of the countries that students had come from disappeared in the language study uh, environment and also because of the age of the students. Um, we all know that there was a fairly sordid history between Japan and Korea for many years in the first half of the 20th century. Yet, when we had Korean and Japanese students with us, there were generations that have moved beyond that and they would actually have Korean boyfriends with Japanese girlfriends. The interesting thing was they'd explore their personality, often they'd dye their hair purple and they'd be sort of this more um, ebullient sort of personality you could see. But then when they got their graduation certificate and the day before they were returning to their country, they'd often dye their hair back to black because they had to fit in. But it's a very interesting dynamic to see in terms of how students are not only exploring a different language, a different culture, but also a different part of themselves. And the other part that came out of this is uh, just the um, connections that students make with each other. Um, we joked that we should have got a commission for being in the marriage business because many students did take up with other students, but also in a business sense. Uh, we talk about the global economy. Many students made friends from, with students from other countries and then they became connect, connection points in their businesses and other areas of, of uh, communication after they left Canada. Now, in terms of the contributing to global citizenship, and I think it's interesting to explore why would students come to Canada and what do they gain from Canada? And again, we're thinking about what Canada gains from having international students in our presence. I've talked about the economic effects and there are some controversial things that we can talk about as well, uh, which we may get into a little bit more uh, towards the end here. But what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you, is I'd like to highlight a few points about global citizenship uh, by um, delving into three stories that appear in my book about students from three different settings. The third of whom actually I worked with in Calgary. And I'd just like to preface the first story with an observation or comment for myself in terms of working with international students. Saying that I have gained invaluable insights from international students in both informal and formal interactions does not do justice to their profound influence on my career. I've also found it useful in my work to bear in mind that everyone has a story and that many are going through personal upheavals because of events in their home countries and or their shifting attitudes to their own place in the world. I believe that international study is a force for expanding people's views of the world. For instance, female Saudi students who experience freedoms overseas may further question their limited rights when they return home. Of course, as an Aussie friend points out, countries that we may brand as oppressive say that we're trying to oppress them with our Western culture and ideals. In the last week of 2020, Canadian media again reported on the case of the Saudi woman 
Lujain Al-Falul, a graduate of the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, where she had also studied in an English language program. Upon her return to Saudi Arabia, she received a six-year prison sentence for speaking out in favour of basic women's rights, such as the right of women to drive. This right had actually been enacted in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia since she was incarcerated. On February 11, 2021, Canada's Globe and Mail reported her transition to home detention, saying that Ms. al Falou remained on probation and was barred from leaving Saudi Arabia for five years. And that travel ban actually stays in effect. And her husband is also under arrest in Saudi Arabia. Despite the tragic costs to Lejeune Halfalu and her family, she's a very brave activist for change in her country. We might ask, what role does international study in places like Canada play for students such as Miss Halfalu? We can reasonably surmise that learning English and completing a degree in a Western country must have offered insights to this extraordinary strong young woman. So I think that's an example of you know, someone coming to Canada, having an experience in a Western culture and going back to a, a different society altogether where women's rights are obviously you know, quite different to say the least and having this experience. Uh, as an aside, I, I should also say that um, Lejeune Alphalou was actually nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2019 and 2020 and she actually won the Bakhlev Haval Peace Prize in 2020. So pretty incredible and she was also listed in Time Magazine in 2019 on one of the world's 100 most influential people. Another factor with um, uh, international study is we do have students that, that after their experience do stay in Canada and there's a lot of media attention about what they take from Canada but I think it's also important to frame what they bring to Canada and who these folks are and there's a story about one person I'll just read briefly and that is uh, a gentleman that I work with in Languages Canada, uh, Charbel Marino, uh, who um, was kind enough to share his story about his journey as a student. Growing up in Mexico, Chabelle said there, were, there was a lot of awareness of the US, but not of Canada. However, he liked listening to Canadian popular music and decided that he would study in Canada because he thought it would be affordable and offer him an opportunity to attain the English proficiency of a native speaker. Arriving in Halifax shortly after 9-11, his expectations were confirmed within a short time that living and studying in in this Canadian city would be comfortable for him and fit his budget. He also bonded with his host couple, who like him were in their 20s, and with whom he is good friends to this day. Chabelle reports that one day, several months after moving to Halifax, he had an epiphany while riding a bus home from classes. The use of English around him had sounded like a model until that point, but now he understood what people sitting near him were saying about a movie. A further surprise awaited him when he returned to Mexico and found that he was super homesick, his words, for Canada. He had found his, his tribe and his life in Canada, especially when he met and married his wife, who was also from Mexico and had been a student in Vancouver. These days, Chabot works as a recruitment supervisor at the University of Toronto, where he says his work resonates with values that he describes as Canadian, harmony, peace and respect. Again, another aspect to an international student experience where there's exchange both ways, student bringing values to Canada and also taking from learning English and his cultural experience something that obviously was transformative. And the last story is a story that I look back on with some amusement with a student that studied uh, in Calgary just a few years after we opened the school in the late 90s. The story is a little bit longer, but bear with me. One larger than life character at that time in the school was Juan Duque, an 18 year old from Colombia. In 1998, he led us on a merry dance. At times, he was akin to a one man wrecking crew. One evening, Lynn, our assistant director, received a call from our activities coordinator 
who said that Juan had been involved in a fight in a bar. Lynn went down there and dissuaded the bar owner from pressing charges. Juan also made little effort to speak English in the school and teachers reported that he was disruptive in class. One day when Juan's mayhem had gone a little too far, I called him into my office. I think we've got some teachers here who've been through similar scenarios. Juan slumped into a chair and looked at me like I was from a different planet. I assumed that he was acting out because he wanted to party with no holds barred in what he saw as the relatively unfettered environment of Canada, of Calgary, sorry. He was also trying to come to terms with the political and social unrest in his country. We learned from his agent that his father was the mayor of a small city and that one of Juan's relatives had been kidnapped by FARC, FARC, the Colombian rebel group. Despite an exuberant social life, Juan was making great strides with his English. He was clearly very bright as well as charismatic. He seemed emboldened by the fact that other students looked up to him. Slouching into my office, he began listing all the things that he thought were wrong with the school, as if he were an adversary making a list of demands. I decided we needed to shift the paradigm. I invited Juan to switch seats with me. So, so he was now looking at me from my side of the desk while I acted like him and slumped back in the chair he had been in. Juan looked at me quizzically. He was clearly enjoying the attention yet wondering where this little role play would go. I continued, now Juan, let's pretend that you are the manager of the Langley School instead of me. Now you must respond to me as if I am the student, Juan Duque. You tell me how I should behave in this school and make the most of my time in Calgary. After a lighthearted exchange when he was just as bemused at my eccentricity in this conversation as I was with his antics in general, I pointed to my name on the door. Okay, Juan, can you answer a question for me? What is the name on the door? He shifted uncomfortably as he sensed a change of tone in the repartee. He responded slowly and sounded out my name as Juan Taplin, Director of Programs. Right, I responded, Juan Taplin, not Juan Duque. Now here's the deal. When you have your own school and it says Juan Duque on the door, then you can make the rules. And remember, you will sometimes have to deal with difficult students, so you will need to be kind and patient. He pursed his lips, nodded as if he was a goalie and I had just scored. We shook hands and I said, look Juan, you're going to be a leader one day back in Colombia because you are already a leader here in the school. Please stay out of trouble and keep learning and stop giving the staff such a hard time because we're all only trying to help you. During the rest of his six months at the school, Juan did not exactly heed my words. He liked to stir things up. He was switched from homestay to homestay as he quickly exhausted the goodwill of each host family. But there was a positive coda to our time with Juan. Seven years later, in 2005, out of the blue, I received an email written in almost flawless English. It read, hello, Mr. Taplin. This is Juan Duque. I don't know if you remember me. In 1998, I studied at Global Village Calgary, or Rocky Mountain English Centre, as it was also called. I trust that you and Lynn are well. I am now 25 years old and doing well in my city in Colombia. I have a good job in the field of international economics, and my study time at your school helped me to use English well and to get a job. Now I have a good career and even a wife because I am married. I also write to you because I want to apologize. When I was in Calgary, I had many troubling things in my life and I caused your school much as problems. I am sorry for that. You and Lynn treated me well in spite of all. I just want to say I remember you well and thank you for everything from the bottom of my heart. Your student, Juan Duque. Yeah, and I think there's got people here who maybe that story resonates for as well as teachers, we often don't know what happens to our students after we have our interactions with them. They go out into the world and it's, it's so unusual to get an affirmation like that years later. Although it is kind of one of the byproducts of the internet that um, we, um, 
do keep in touch with students a bit, you know, by email or Instagram or these kinds of things. One of the other things that I just wanted to mention too was our group of schools was called Global, Eng Global Village English Centres. And of course, Global Village, you may recall, was the, the term coined by Marshall McLuhan, actually uh, born in Edmonton, uh, with his uh, famous mantra in the 60s, the medium is the message. And uh, one of the things that for us Global Village represented was bringing students together from across the world and did a little bit more reading about Marshall McLuhan, you know, as research for my book. And it, it's quite interesting to, to think about how he was uh, presciently foreshadowing the internet and also seeing and saying that what, happened in, well, what happens in one part of the world will be communicated very quickly to another part of the world. And I don't think he was just talking about COVID-19. He was talking about, you know, just messages and, and information in general, and how tribes would form and, and cross international boundaries. Um, and of course, we know that online um, communities proliferate for good or ill. And so, you know, I think it's just very interesting to go back and look at look at uh, Marshall McLuhan's uh, work. And also, in the course of my research, I came across a book edited by an Ottawa author, Elaine Kuhn, uh, Kahn, sorry, K-A-H-N, um, Letters Between Pierre Elliott Trudeau and Marshall McLuhan, been hoping we might meet again. Now, we're in BC here rather than Alberta, so I think I can say Pierre Elliott Trudeau out loud, okay? Um, and just, the, the book is actually quite interesting, the letters were written in the late 60s, early 70s, where Marshall McLuhan is giving him some pretty, uh, giving Trudeau some pretty um, uh, forceful advice on what to do about his media presentation of his persona. The other story that I came across in reading about Marshall McLuhan was that um, in the late 60s, he had very serious uh, brain surgery and he went through uh, an incredibly lengthy operation and uh, when he came out of the anaesthetic, uh, the surgeon and his family members were in the room and waiting for Marshall McLuhan to regain consciousness. And if, this is Marshall McLuhan, you know, the great thinker, the great mind, and there was definite nervous energy in the room about, you know, is he going to be able to function? Is he going to have, you know, is he going to be able to speak? And Marshall McLuhan came to and the surgeon said, well, Dr. McLuhan, how are you feeling? And he looked up and he said, depends what you mean by feeling. And people looked around the room and one of, his, one of the people said, oh, he's back. <laughs> so um, that's kind of a quick run through of some of the the issues pertaining to international students that that I've worked with or that I've been um, aware of. And uh, just before I talk a little bit more about the, the book, I just wondered if there's any comments or questions that people have. I've tried not to delve into the sticky political questions about international students and housing, but Ron. Okay. Um, John, if you know, English is a complex language. How long Good question. In our schools in Global Village, we would actually have students who might only attend for two weeks. Uh, we'd have students from Quebec who'd only have a two week vacation, for example. We did have students that stayed for up to two years. The average length of time was something like three to four months. And um, of course, Younger people whose brains are more pliable seem to be able to learn a second or an additional language much more quickly than maybe you can when you're 65 plus. Um, and so with the immersion experience, so living with families that would speak English in the home, a total environment in the school where you had to use English not only during class time but as much as possible during break time, we felt that if the student was prepared to do their homework and come to class, they could move from 
a low level of proficiency to an advanced level of proficiency within nine to 12 months with intensive study. Now, of course, there are always exceptions to that. Uh, and, uh, but it was, you know, that's sort of our rule of thumb that we would advance students through the levels based on that progress. Again, making sure that they did attend class and did their assignments and, and those kinds of things. Yes. Yeah, we had a lot of discussions about that over the years. Um, in our uh, group and in the private language industry in general, class, classes are generally smaller, so we try to keep them to about 14 to 16. Even in the university and college programs, they try not to have more than about 20 to 24 students. So again, trying to keep classes smaller so students would get more in individual attention within the classes. Um, so, the key thing was, of course, having trained teachers, teachers that had taken uh, programs of varying lengths, but at least had practicum experience to work with um, students. Even within one class, we know that even if there's all, say, upper beginner speakers of English, there's a range. So trying to, to, to basically tailor it to the, the group. Um, but there's no one set rule. There were different schools doing different things. Um, we basically put a lot of store in participation and students would come to class and participate actively and be given a lot of opportunities in class. Part of our training in, for teachers was to make sure that the teachers didn't do the bulk of the talking but the students had maximised opportunity for talking. Also based on students' uh, background, some were better studiers than others, some were, you know, we had European students who came in who already had a second or third language and just seemed to pick up English like that. So it was, it was variable. But then we had standards at each level where students had to meet a proficiency range across the different skills. Yes? You already answered my question in your previous presentation, but uh, I'm interested in where most students come from, Good question. Uh, it, it depends on the sector essentially in, um, in Languages Canada, which is the sector I worked within, uh, where there's approximately 150,000 students. Uh, most of the students that are coming into private language schools are from a whole variety of, of countries, um, but not many Chinese students. The Chinese students are generally going into university and college diploma programs because the Chinese government wants to know that they will actually get into university rather than just into a language school program. So you'll see more Chinese students in the public sector. And also we know there's been a lot of attention, especially in places like Toronto, on Indian students and the struggles they're having um, with re regards to housing. And um, so there's, there's a large Indian uh, population also coming to get advanced degrees or undergraduate degrees in Canada for sure. But in Global Village, as the name suggests, we work very hard to have a truly international community. So in our school in Victoria right now, for example, we have about 30% of students from Japan, and then about 30% of our students are from a variety of Latin countries. So it, you know, it depends a little bit by city. Brent. Yeah, uh, so I know the pandemic hit the industry pretty hard. And, uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think one of the things is that we're still not out of the pandemic yet in terms of um, just where we're at with international education. The good news is that Canada is a very popular destination. It's seen as having you know, world-class educational facilities, uh, tolerant communities, um, all those good things. Um, but we're in a very competitive environment, for example, um, going up against Australia, UK, the US even, uh, New Zealand. And I have to say that in Australia, 
um, the language industry is, is much more supported as an export industry. So, for example, people are able to get visas more quickly, whereas there seems to be a hold up in terms of visa processing when we book students to come and study in our schools. Um, in terms of where we're at, I mean, during the dark days of the pandemic, and you, of course you must realise that the language industry, I hate to use the word perfect storm, but it was really just um, slammed because international travel stopped and we just couldn't have students in class uh, during the pandemic, literally in places like Calgary and Victoria, Toronto, Vancouver, we were offering um, classes on Friday the 13th of March, the dreaded Friday the 13th in 2020, and by the Monday we stopped operating classes. So we had to pivot to Zoom and, and do all those things. And a year later we were told, you know, it may be 2024 before the industry comes back. And that's actually proven to be the case. Um, and in the private sector, um, we actually have uh, all mergers and acquisitions. There are some groups set up with venture equity money now, and there are other smaller operations which are just owner operated. So there's a whole mishmash of, um, of different things. So, you know, it's slow to come back. Um, you know, in Global Village, for example, we had four schools in Canada, but uh, now we have two in Victoria and Calgary, and uh, we've got about 240 students total in the summer in those two locations. I don't know if I answered your question, but it's slow. <laughs> yeah. Given that native English is different between here, Australia, New Zealand, mm -hmm. and the UK, and mm -hmm. variation, is there a preferred location that, that all these students want? That's a very good uh, question. Canada stacks up really well because the accent is considered to be more neutral. Uh, but then Australia has some actual uh, benefits in language programs that students don't have in Canada. In our sector, for example, students can't go out and get a job. They can't even work in the service industry. If they go into university uh, as an international student, then they're able to, to get up to at least 20 hours of paid work to help fund their tuition. But in Australia, there are different rules. So that's an attractive selling point for the Australian industry. Um, I think it's a lot of it is to do with um, where students want to travel to, where their families think that they might get a good education. Um, I've often been surprised just, uh, even though we're told that in terms of language acquisition, uh, learning a second language accent is one of the last things that you take on. I remember one time I was in uh, Japan and uh, I was talking to a person who had obviously learned English and I said, well, which part of Australia did you study in? And she goes, how did you know I studied in Australia? <laughs> and she was from Japan, so I had a pretty good idea. Uh, but that's kind of unusual, yeah. But Canada is really seen, if, if, you know, we work with agents um, who work through travel agents. So if you're running a travel agent in Seoul, Korea, you, you probably got a part of your business where uh, you're advertising language programs in different countries to send students and you'll get a commission based on that. And there's been a fair bit of attention on the uh, worst parts of that business. Uh, for example, uh, Mark Miller and a recent uh, Minister for Education, or Immigration, sorry, uh, federally said that there are bad actors, you know, in, in India, for example, uh, giving false promises to students about possibly getting a degree and, and then being residents. And that's true, there are bad actors everywhere. But in my experience, we, we work with a lot of really good partners who wanted the best for their students, and that was a better business model for them, to, for their students to have success. Yes? Um, I'm always interested in, in history, obviously. Uh, I'm not, I've always been curious as to how various accents within English have evolved over in the last 500 years uh, since we all have uh, come out of the UK. Mm -hmm. And how would the Australian accent evolve, the Canadian accent, and the, the, the variation even in the United States, that just evolves from the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because 
some of those accents don't seem to uh, exist at all in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. I think that's a whole different lunchtime topic for a future brown bay. <laughs> like to see. <laughs> Um, it's true though, I mean, you know, obviously, well maybe not obvious to some, but there are um, accents that sort of travel back through time. For example, you know, as we know, Australia was settled by a lot of convicts, and that, that came from a particular working class out of Ireland and England, and so there's sort of an evolution that, that happened there. Um, when I first moved to Canada in 1984, because back to me, um, you know, I was at pains to point out to people that not all Australians spoke as if they were from the outback, that we had, you know, 90% of people lived in uh, urbanised centres and people would say, well, say something in Australian. And I was trying to say, well, we're not all from the outback. And then two years later, um, Crocodile Dundee came out, you know, and Paul Hogan, and so that was the end of that conversation. I couldn't persuade anyone after that. If I could, I've just got about five or ten minutes left, um, and um, one of the questions I think that occurred to me and may occur to you, just since I've written the book I've had so many people say to me, well I'm thinking of writing a, a, a personal memoir, um, how do I go about it? And one of the things that I tried to do and um, was to and this was through the influence of an editor that I was fortunate enough to find, is that I wanted to come up with something that was um, a little bit different. So she encouraged me to do what, she, what we described as a personal and business memoir. So not just my personal story throughout, but also uh, looking at the trajectory of a business and going back through, through different stages in the language business. Uh, I guess one of the things that uh, I would say is, first of all, you could call it a pandemic thing. A lot, a lot of people have written memoirs during the pandemic. Um, you could call it self-therapy. Uh, but I think it's interesting because, you know, there's kind of a compulsion sometimes to, to share information and knowledge. And so, um, again, as I said, I was fortunate to find a story editor who, um, I presented her with a very lengthy well, she actually didn't read the first draft. She said, well, you know, send me 30 pages and I'll see if you can write, and then um, we'll go from there. And what she did was she basically uh, changed my whole approach because it's very common to, to write a memoir you, chronologically. You start when you're a kid, you go forward, um, and there's some very fine memoirs, no doubt, that are written that way. But she challenged me quite cleverly to go back and have a thematic approach so that, you know, I didn't hold tenaciously onto all of the writing that I'd done and I had to go back and, and look at areas like homestay and uh, these other areas that I highlighted at the beginning. Um, and then the other thing she suggested I do, which was actually a bit challenging first, was to come up with tips at the end of each chapter. So to, to make it something that might um, work for people that are in different stages of a career in education. So for example, whether you're a starting teacher, what are some, you know, what are some things there? If you're going to be a manager in a language school, what are some ideas if you're going to work in marketing? And then the other thing that I wanted to think about was um, just this whole idea of organizational culture. Of course, I was writing from a particular perspective of working, having worked as a teacher, teacher trainer, and then manager, and then owner of a language school, I was very interested in this whole idea of how do you build a team? And um, my story editor, Sally, who has a musical back background, uh, she wanted me to go with a title on my chapter called Good Vibrations, you know, the Beach Boys thing. And I said, and this is another thing to be prepared for. If you have an editor and you have a draft, you're going to have some interesting pushback conversations with your editor, and that's all part of the process. Um, and so I said, well, actually, I want to go a little bit deeper than that, you know, because nobody seems to talk about what happens when things go wrong on a team, whether you're working uh, in a language school or it might be uh, a healthcare field or some other field. 
And so I said, I don't really want to call it good vibrations because I want to basically delve a little bit into the topic of what happens when you have to let somebody go. Because those people aren't walking out the doorway of your organization whistling Dixie and saying that was a good vibration. So that's sort of a, an example of where we sort of modified the approach and talked about uh, some of the difficulties in working with, with teams in my particular sector. And then, you know, some folks that have read the book have been kind enough to say, you know, it's interesting that chapter on team vibrations also has some resonance for the area that I was working with. And one of the interesting things that um, I kind of experienced and uh, was a bit of an eye-opener for me was that as an administrator, uh, people you know, would ask you, do you have the ability to hire and fire? And I think most progressive thinking people say, yeah, I've got the ability to hire, but I really don't want to fire. You know, this is, it's not fun. You know, you know, if you're outside of an organization and you're thinking that it's, it's going to be fun to, to not renew someone's contract, um, it's a really, you can go through a lot of dark hours in the middle of the night lying awake about what you're going to do with someone who's not a productive member of the team. And, um, the other thing is your organization's often invested a lot in training that person. The person might be going through um, different issues themselves and you want to be sensitive to that. But sometimes when you do make the hard decision, uh, what happens is other people in your organization come up to you and say, well, it's so much better in the staff room now that that person's gone. John, However bad you thought it was, it was even worse. So again, I'm sort of pushing at a negative thing here because in my experience, the overwhelming number of people that I've worked with have felt a real a passion about teaching and working in international education. But this is just one area where I just wanted to, to delve a little more deeply.